is that if you have all turned your video on, then you're going to be more careful about what you're doing as you're listening. It'll help you listen well. So I'd like to suggest that everyone please turn your video on. Because if you don't have your video on, then, you know, you could be like that Canadian member of parliament the other day, and who knows what's going on. So you don't want to do that. Please make sure you have your clothes on first and then turn the video on. And um, I think it'll help us all be more mindful and aware. And frankly, it also helps me as a teacher so that I can see more of you out there. One of the things is I am in this huge shrine room. There is me and there is Lama Surya. And that's it. And so it's helpful for me to be able to see your reactions. Well, then I can know that I said something terrible. <laughs> So now we will um, begin, um, and the first thing is we will begin with the Vajra Dara lineage prayer. Um, so we are reciting this prayer because, uh, for one thing, that's what Tranga Rinpoche always uh, does and what many Kaju masters does. It's a great prayer, um, and it gives ins important instructions that have been passed down um, through many generations, important instructions on meditation and so forth. There are great blessings in it. So we will now recite the prayer. So just give me a second to get my uh, screen sharing going. Okay, here we go. Share. There we are. Dorje Chanche de Lonarotan Marpa Milachuje Campo Du som che cha kun che karma ba che shi chun ye Sombar 
Dharma Expanse Palace of Akanishta is the essence of all Buddhas of the three times who show me directly in my mind is Dharmakaya. I prostrate to the glorious, exalted Guru. Please bless me and all sentient beings that our minds become the Dharma. Please bless us that the Dharma become the path. Please bless us that the path dispel confusion. Please bless us that confusion arise as wisdom. So now please think to yourself that no matter what, we must bring all of our, all sentient beings who have all been our mothers in some past life or other. We've had an infinite number of past lives. And in many of those past lives, we have had mothers. And so there is, it's certain because we've had an infinite number of past lives that any given sentient being has been our mother at least once. And because it's been an infinite number of lives, then therefore they've actually been our mother an infinite number of times. 
We just don't recognize that. But just as we wish that our mother is in this lifetime, be happy and not suffer, then we also should have the same wish for those who have been our mothers and who have been equally kind to us in previous lifetimes and wish that they be happy and not suffer. Or if you want to look at it in a different perspective, all we, we're all interconnected and no sentient being can be considered independent of another. Everything we do depends upon other sentient beings. And so our very life depends upon every single other sentient being, not only on this planet, but on all other planets in some web of interdependence. And so we depend upon them to be here right now. So we need to be grateful for them and think of the kindness they have done. And then remembering that wish to bring them to um, happiness and do what we can to bring them to be free of suffering. And the only way we can do that ultimately is to bring them to Buddhahood. So please, uh, listen this afternoon with the motivation of wanting to bring all of our mothers, all sentient beings throughout space to the state of Buddhahood. In order to do this, we have to meditate, but to meditate, we have to know what we are doing. So we have to engage in listening and contemplation. So today we are listening. The Dharma we are listening to is the way of the Bodhisattva. And in the way of the Bodhisattva, or to give the full title, Entering the Way of the Bodhisattva. In the Entering the Way of the Bodhisattva, there are 10 chapters. We are discussing the seventh chapter, the chapter on diligence this weekend. And the chapter on diligence basically has two main parts. After the first verse and first five lines, the rest of the chapter has two main parts. The methods to eliminate the impediments to diligence, and then the methods to increase our diligence. And so we're speaking about the first of these. The methods to, uh, uh, to overcome the impediments to diligence, which means the methods to overcome the three types of laziness. So to just review the three types of laziness, they are sloth, clinging to bad actions, and um, self-deprecation, the three types of laziness. So, in, uh, so after identifying those three and talking about their causes, which are not fearing suffering, being attached to the pleasures of samsara, being attached in particular to the pleasure of sleep, um, then Shantideva discusses the antidotes for each of these. So he first sta spe starts speaking about the antidotes for uh, the laziness of sloth. So there are two different methods to overcome, the uh, to overcome the laziness of sloth. So sloth is what? It's basically what we think about as laziness, indolence, sloth, just liking to sit around, kick up your legs, and do nothing. Just sit there, sleep, laze about, sunbathe, maybe. Yeah, that might be lazy. Whatever you want to do. If you're just lazing about doing nothing, then that is the laziness of sloth. And so the, uh, the antidotes to it are first remembering impermanence. So we spoke about impermanence this morning. So the meditating on impermanence is remembering that you're going to die soon. Now the point of remembering that you're going to die soon is not just to scare yourself. There's a little bit of that, but that's not the main point. The main point of the meditation on impermanence is to realize that you have an incredible opportunity right now. You are intelligent human beings. Not only are you intelligent human beings, but you're among the rare breed of human beings who have actually come into contact with the Dharma. This is incredibly rare. And not only that, you have a chance to do something about it. And many of you have already started to do Dharma practice. And so now you have to remember how, 
how fortunate we are to be in this position. Um, and remembering that and realizing that this position is not going to last long at all. Uh, we have no idea when the Lord of death will come or whether we will have finished the things we want to do. So that's the first method for eliminating the laziness of sloth. And then the second method for eliminating the laziness of sloth is, excuse me, is to contemplate the sufferings of the lower realms. So, I mean, death and impermanence are not really a popular topic. I mean, I mean, when you talk about death and impermanence, I think a lot of Dharma centers don't schedule this and don't give a lot of talks on it because no one wants to talk about death and impermanence. People don't like it. It's not fun. And that's understandable because in some ways it's not. So, but the second method is even less popular. And that is to meditate on the sufferings of the lower realms. Now, people don't like a talk, to talk about the lower realms. And when they are talking about in Western write, writings on Buddhism, they are often talked about as analogies for psychological states. In other words, Western Buddhist writings don't really take them as being real. They sort of pre present them as being like another way to understand our existence as humans. So there's something there. But in the traditional teachings, um, it's kind of the other way around. In the traditional teachings, the lower realms are often taught uh, that the lower realms and the afflicted states of, uh, excuse me, that the afflicted states of anger and so forth are analogies for the lower realms. It's the other way around. Instead of the lower realms being analogies for our own psychological states, which is a, can be helpful, it's looking actually seeing that our own mental states are analogies for the lower realms. So when you look at the intense nature of hatred and anger, for example, then you can understand the sufferings of the hells. But when you look at Western writers, it's often the other way around. So it sounds like the lower realms are no more than psychological states. But there's a problem with that. It doesn't make sense. Because we teach about there being six realms, right? Hells, hungry ghosts, animals, humans, demigods, and gods. Six realms. Or you can say five if you count the demigods as either gods or hungry ghosts. Five or six realms. But of those five or six realms, we only see two humans and animals, right? But we do see two, two different realms. We see humans and we see animals, right? So animals are one of the three lower realms, right? Now, are animals a psychological state of human beings? Think about it. So like when you are seeing a cow or a bull, are you actually seeing Aunt Bessie or Uncle Ferdinand? I don't think so. Cows are not people. Bulls are not people. They're cattle. They're oxen. Last time I checked, at least, right? So we know that animals are a different state. Now, we can't see the other, uh, other realms. Um, we can kind of understand them. Minga Rinpoche, among other lamas, but I remember Minga Rinpoche teaching this and um, I, on, on occasion when he was teaching at the Kajumunlam and I was translating for him. So I'm paraphrasing him for him here. So if any of you have has taken his teachings, then if I'm getting it wrong, I'm sorry. But what I remember him saying is that um, when we are experiencing anger, if you look at the essence of anger, that is an experience of the hells. This is an, on a profound level, this is very, very true. But there is a big difference between the profound experience, but between the experience of hells that we have as human beings and the experience of bells of hells that the beings who are in the hell realms experience. Our experiences of anger are fairly quick. They last a, generally, even for the angry, angriest person, they have a defined limit. If someone is angry, if a human is angry from the time that they are born until the time that they die, they are angry no more than 85 years, 90 years, however long they live. And even most human beings are not angry that whole time. But the hell beings experience this state of anger and they're stuck in it and they can't get out of it for a long time. And so then the world around them all appears in the form of a hell. So for them, the experience of the hell is as real as the experience of the human realm that we have. 
So it's true that we can't see them and we can't conceive of how they could exist, but that doesn't mean that they do not exist. Not seeing something does not mean it does not exist. To give an example from present day, we have physics and there is dark matter. So physicists have no idea what dark matter actually is. They can calculate according to the CERN website that there is six times as much dark matter as there is visible matter, but they cannot see dark matter itself and they cannot measure it directly. So it's similar with the lower realms. Now, I think another problem that we often have with the lower realms, and instead, in, in addition to not really believing that they're possible, we also don't like the idea of the talk culturally as Westerners in particular. And I think uh, for Americans where we have a long tradition of, of the revivals and um, a strong Protestant tradition, when we hear people talking about the lower realms, frankly, it reminds us of Puritan talk of hell and brimstone and of a judgmental Bible thumping deity and morality. But there are two important points we have to understand here. So first, the Buddhist teachings about the lower realms say that the lower realms are the natural result of bad actions. If you do something bad, it will have a bad result in the future. It's not a punishment. It's like uh, it's not a judgment by a supreme deity who is willing to condemn you to eternal damnation. Instead, it's a warning about cause and effect. It is like saying, if you touch a live electric wire, you will get electrocuted. Saying, if you do bad actions, you will experience bad results. It is what naturally happens because of cause and effect. So it is not considered a punishment in Buddhism. It's just the natural result. The second important point is that when we talk about the lower realms, there is no judgment of the beings who are in the lower realms for being morally lesser in some way. We're not saying evil person damned to hell. Instead, we are saying we are only, there's only compassion and the wish to relieve those beings of suffering. There's no judgment. Buddhism is not a judgmental religion. No matter how horrible of the deed a person has done, and no matter how deep into the hells they fall because of their karma, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas only have compassion for them, and we should be the same. So I've never seen in any of the texts I've read, the Buddhist texts I've read, any sutra, any treatise, or any of the various other texts I've read, I've never heard read anywhere, and I've never heard a Lama say that the beings in hell deserve their fate. There's nothing like that. There is no let them rot in hell. Instead, there's only the wish to free them from their suffering, no matter how heinous their action may have been. So this is an important point. So we've got two big, uh, big distinctions. There's the, it's not a judgment, it's not a punishment, it's not uh, something that it should be condemned. It is an opportunity for compassion. There are beings who are suffering. It doesn't matter what they did in the past. We've all done horrible things in our past lives. We've all done all the horrible things in our past lives. So there's only compassion. Like for example, with the Buddha, and his cousin Devadatta. So Devadatta tried to kill the Buddha on at least three occasions. There was the first occasion when he uh, had a boulder pitched down the side of Vulture Peak Mountain that almost killed the Buddha. He struck his toe instead of his body. The second time was when he loosed the, um, the elephant in the town of Rajgir to hoping that the right, you know, this crazy elephant would uh, trample him to death. And the third time was when David Datta tried to poison him. David Datta put poison on his fingernails. And then he went to massage the Buddha's feet. But the Buddha knew. And so the story goes that he emanated his feet into, be, into crystal. And the poison could not affect the Buddha, but it got onto David Datta's hands and Devadatta perished right there. And at the moment that he was perishing, the Buddha had compassion for him, knowing that he had tried to kill him. And when the Buddha, Devadatta was reborn in the incessant realm, the Buddha still spoke of him with great compassion to the monks, 
There's only compassion, even to the people who try to do the worst thing possible to you. So when we talk about the lower realms in Buddhism, we're saying, be careful, watch out, or you will suffer. If you do that, you will be in danger. Don't, it's like saying, don't get close to the edge of the cliff or you might fall off. Uh, we can't see the sufferings of the hells or hungry ghosts with our own eyes, except for there are a few people who uh, experience, who see these sufferings in uh, near-death experiences and in other states. But generally, we cannot see them. But we do see the sufferings of animals. So merely not seeing the suffering of the, of the hells and the hungry ghosts does not prove that they do not exist. But we don't see them. So as the treatises say, we have to take the lower realms and karmic cause and effect on faith. They're completely hidden. So we can only know them because of trusting the Buddha, because of trusting the great masters, including the Karmapa, the Dalai Lama, Trangu Rinpoche, whichever master, male, female, whatever. It doesn't matter when they speak about karmic cause and effect. They're telling us the, uh, something that they feel is true. And so if we trust them about the instructions on Mahamudra, Shouldn't we also trust them about the teachings on the lower realms? Well, anyways, when we talk about the lower realms, there's believing in them. And then there are the contemplations of the sufferings of the lower realms. And this is um, included in the contemplation of the four thoughts that turn the mind. It's the contemplation of the fourth, the contemplation of the defects of samsara. So the idea is that when you remember the suffering of the lower realms, you're going to inspire yourself to Dharma practice now while you have a chance. You realize, I'm human. I can do something to prevent me from falling into the lower realms. And if I'm not careful, then there's a big danger for my next life. Right? So you have to remember. You have to remember that when you're going to die, when you think about karma, cause and effect, there is a danger that you might be reborn and the hells are as a hungry ghost or as an animal. Even if you don't believe 100%, if you kind of take it a little bit on faith, then you think there's a, there's a possibility that the Buddha is right. There's a possibility that Rinpoche and the Karmapa and the Dalai Lama are right. So there's a possibility that you may well be born in those realms. And if you don't do anything about it, it could be terrifying. But if you take to heart and practice the Dharma and listen, contemplate, and meditation as much as you can, then you've got a really good head start on making sure you won't be born in the lower realms. But if instead we disregard these teachings and accumulate the causes of rebirth in the lower realms, then it's bad. It could be very bad when we were re reborn. So we must not let ourselves waste this precious human life with all its incredible opportunities. And it's the basis for bringing ourselves and all other beings happiness. So that's kind of the background, kind of an important thing to say about karmic cause, uh, about, excuse me, about the lower realms uh, these days, because it is a big question. As I said in the morning, I'm not saying thou shalt believe in the lower realms. I'm not saying that you must believe. I'm saying you need to think, you need to look, consider the evidence. And in my uh, uh, feeling is that the evidence is pretty convincing. Um, and so we have to be, uh, have to be careful uh, ourselves. You have to use your minds, but you have to have an open mind first. So that's the uh, sort of the aside, the, what do we call that? Pontification about the lower realms. So it's probably time to actually get to the text. So Shantideva does speak about the lower realms uh, quite a bit. And in speaking about the uh, lower realms, so we, he's already spoken about the sufferings of, um, of samsara. So when he begins his discussion about the sufferings of the lower realms, he first begins to note that um, we're actually unable to <clears throat> bear the suffering of this present life. Uh, if the suffering of this present life is so horrible, do we think that we're going to be able to bear the sufferings of the lower realms in future lives? So as he says in verse 11, if like a living writhing fish, you have such terror in this life, what of the intense suffering of hell from the misdeeds you've done? 
so the analogy here is of a fish writhing on hot sand. So the fish has been caught by a fisherman and is put on the sand on the riverbank. The sand is so hot, it's like it's India and the hot sand is really hot and it's dry and the fish flops around in pain. So we're the same way when we experience suffering in this lifetime. It says if we also, <coughs> excuse me, we're also writhing around trying to get away from the pain. What's the first thing you do when you, when you feel pain? You pull back from it, try to avoid it. Or then if you still feel pain, you pop a pill, you try to do something to get rid of the pain. If we can't bear the pain that we experience in this lifetime, lifetime, how will it be in the future if we are reborn in the hells? Uh, so uh, if we can't do that, forget about being able to put up with the suffering of the lower realms. And then in the next stanza, Shantideva gives another, uh, oops, I went to next to stanza. An uh, it gives another analogy here. Your flesh is tender when it's touched by scalding water, yet you've done the karma of the hottest hells. Why do you stay so comfortably? So here, when you're touched by scalding water, when you're cooking and hot water splashes on your hands, what do you do? You run to the sink and you pour cold water on your hands. Or you look for the aloe vera and, and put the aloe vera on your hands to soothe the pain. But this amount of suffering uh, is small compared to the suffering, uh, suffering that you will experience in hell. So the karma of the hottest hells. You have done the karma of the hottest hells, he says. But you're thinking to yourself, okay, I'm just a regular middle class, you know, North American. I go to my job. I haven't murdered anyone. I've maybe only done a little bit of white collar crime. Nothing too bad. I'm not going to fall into the hells, am I? In fact, you might have lived your entire life as a saint. So Shantideva, uh, so, well, maybe a saint, except for the time you got drunk and slept with someone else's partner or whatever, or whatever you did as a stupid adolescent, all of these things that you probably, that we've all done in our pasts. But they're not what, that's not what Shantideva means. Here, what is important to understand is that because we have had an infinite number of past lives, we have done an infinite number of actions, and many or most of them have been misdeeds, because mostly we act out of greed, hatred, delusion, and the afflictions. So even if you've been saintly in this lifetime and haven't done anything wrong, if you haven't done enough virtue, then in your next lifetime, you are in danger of karma from the past ripening and sending you into the hells in your next lifetime. So he's saying you can't just rest on your laurels in this lifetime and enjoy the pleasures of this life. If you do not practice virtue now, there's no guarantee what will happen in your next. So you need to examine yourself and do whatever you can to purify your misdeeds and obscurations and to accumulate virtue. So with regard to this, then Shantideva says in the next stanza, you want results without any effort, such pain for one so delicate. When grasped by death, you're like a god. Alas, suffering will, dest uh, will destroy you. So basically, we just want to be comfortable. And we don't want to have to work too hard to do it. We want comfort without doing anything to get it. But merely wanting comfort and doing nothing will not help us at all. Now, the only thing that can really bring us good comfort, comfort and a, a true uh, happiness is to be diligent about our Dharma practice. Otherwise, at the, dharm, the time of death, there's nothing else that can help. It doesn't matter if you, you know, in the old days, they'd have a divination or have a ritual done. Or if you have any, what do we do to help at the time of death these days? Um, they give you morphine. That's about all they can do for you at the time of death these days. Um, so the, but that doesn't help you beyond the experience of pain that you're feeling then. None of it's going to help. The only thing that will truly help you is the virtue you've done in this lifetime. So we haven't got any time to waste, and we have to use what little time we have well. Here in the third line, Shanti Deva says, you're like a god. What does he say? He says, when grasped by death, you're like a god. So here's something, this is kind of a reference to 
um, the traditional Buddhist teachings on the realms and the sufferings of the realms. The suffering of the God realm is the suffering of dying and falling. So die, when the gods are about to die, all of the flowers that they were, they always have got, the gods always have flowers and the flowers are always fresh. They always smell good. But when they're about to die, five days before they're going to die, the flowers start wilting. They begin to get body odor. Gods don't have body odor, but then they do. And then the other gods and goddesses will spend any time with them because the other gods and goddesses know that they're going to die and they just don't want to deal. They can't deal. They just want to do, they're gods, right? They just don't want to deal with anything unpleasant. But the gods who are about to die, they actually have clairvoyance because of being gods and they can see where they're going to be reborn. And it terrifies them because when you are a god, then any rebirth just seems completely dreadful by comparison. So there's a really strong psychological suffering for the gods in those days before they die. And that suffering is said to be even more intense than suffering of the incessant hell. The incessant hell is the lowest of the hells where you are, where there is no the, the suffering never uh, relents and you're ex experiencing continual agony. So, you know, another example is like when you lose an election and you can't accept it and you get angry and you spend your whole day being angry about losing an election. That's something we have seen, right? Um, so that's the same type of, of suffering. Now, the, but the next th uh, thing is that sometimes we've been talking, you know, we like, been talking, what did we talk about this morning? A cheery subject, death and impermanence. And now what are we talking about? Another cheery subject, the sufferings of the lower realms, right? So these are not fun to think about. And they're actually also can be quite scary. If you really do the, the contemplations, they can even be uh, seem overwhelming. Um, but actually it's not necessary to feel scared or overwhelmed. overwhelmed. And the reason why it's not necessary is because we have something we can do. And that is here in this next verse. Free yourself with the human boat from the great river of suffering. Such a boat is hard to get again. Now is no time to sleep, you fool. So here Shantideva is comparing our precious human body to a boat. It's like you've come to the bank of a great river like the Ganges in India. The Ganges is huge. There are points where it's like a kilometer across, like over a half mile across. Or maybe it's like getting to the edge of an ocean. So you know while you're going on the journey that you have to cross that river or ocean and you can't do it on your own. You know the river's too wide, the current's too strong, and there's no way you could swim that far. So imagine that you get to the bank of the river. And at the moment you get to that bank, the banks of the river, at that very moment, a boat happens to come right at that moment. It's the ferry, it's going across the river. So you get in the boat and you safely cross the river. Now, if you get to the bank, you see the boat coming and you think, oh, I got some time, you lie down, you take a nap, it's a nice, beautiful day. You're lying out, stretched out in the sun, nice and slothful, right? We're talking about the, the laziness of sloth. You're being indolent there. The boat comes and it goes and you're still asleep, right? What are you going to do then? It's already offshore and it's too late and you're stuck. There's no way to know when the next boat is going to come. It might not be for a very, very long time. So this is the way it is. It's like that with our uh, precious human bodies. We just don't know. We've been waiting to cross the great rivers of suffering, right? In Buddhism, we talk about the four great rivers of suffering, the rivers of suffering of birth, aging, sickness, and death. We want to cross them, but we've had no way to do it. But now we do because we have a precious human body that we can use to reach liberation. This is a once in an eon opportunity if we're lucky. And 
So we must not let it ever go to waste. We must make sure that we use this precious opportunity uh, that we have now. So it's important not to get sucked into sloth and spend all of our time sleeping, relaxing over nice meals and watching Netflix. None of that will do us good, much good in the end. So it's important now. But that being said, I think it's important to look at where you really are. I mean, I'm, I'm ragging on Netflix. I'm ragging, ragging on good meals. But I also know that many of you enjoy these. And just because I'm saying, using them as an example of laziness, that's not going to stop you from doing it. Um, I mean, a lot of people are attached to Netflix and enjoy eating good food with family and friends. And a lot of people are looking forward to doing that again. If only we can all get vaccinated and get together with families and friends. Excellent. We are, that's what we want to do, right? So when, I, when I'm talking about that, I'm not saying you should say, okay, Kempo David said, if I'm going to be diligent, I must give up those and I'm going to give up Netflix. I'm never going to have meals with friends again. No, that is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you need to make the changes gradually. And the first thing to do is to look at your motivations. And the way to look at your motivations is to do the, to contemplate the four thoughts that turn the mind. Uh, as you do that, then gradually your motivation will change. And when your motivation changes, your auto actions will automatically follow. So when you do the contemplations, you say, oh, I, maybe, you know, it's okay, but there are things I'd rather do spend my time doing, right? I was speaking with uh, someone uh, the other day, outside and socially distanced, um, about golf. And this person likes golf, but has been doing practice for Dharma and isn't going as often as, us as usual. Asked me if I'd like to go to play some golf and I've only played once in my life and I don't see much point in going out and starting now. I don't have much time for that. Right? So it's like that. There's nothing particularly wrong with playing golf and people enjoy, enjoy it. But you have to look at your motivation. And as your motivation changes, then your actions will follow. So work on the motivations. You don't need to make big changes on the outside that you can't sustain. You have to change your attitude and let the changes and actions uh, follow naturally. So when Tranga Rinpoche taught this verse last year in Sarnath, he spoke about it as being really, really imp imp um, uh, important. Because when you meditate on death and impermanence or on the sufferings of the lower realms, it can be really sad. It's, it can be really heart-wrenching to think about it. Uh, it's depressing. There's no way around it. And so when you really think to yourself and you really feel, I could go at any moment, that's not a whole lot of fun. So if you just stay there, it's just going to be depressing. It's not going to benefit you. But there's no need to be depressed. And the reason is that we now have the precious human body. It's like we're on the journey. We've come to the edge of the huge river. We know that the river is too wide to cross. And, we've, and as we've been coming towards the edge of the river, we've wondered, how are we going to get closer to it? How are we going to get across it? But we're worried about this. And then you get to the bank of the river. And the moment you arrive there, the boat pulls up. It's like, yes, I've got the boat. I can go. I can make it across the river. How you feel so lucky. You'd, be, you'd just be delighted, right? You'd be overjoyed. So it's the same with our precious human body that has all the leisures and resources that we need to cross the, over the sufferings of uh, birth, aging, sickness, and death. We have everything we need. We just need to use it. We have to take advantage of this incredible situation. It's just amazing that we're here. Uh, so when you think about death and impermanence or the sufferings of samsara, you have to remember that it's not hopeless. There's something you can do. We have good bodies. We have intelligent minds. We have access to the teachings that can help us to uh, re achieve freedom from suffering. All we have to do is use them. In other words, we have to make this life meaningful. Right. So there's the old joke, right? 
many old jokes. The spiritual seeker climbing to the top of the mountain, getting to the top of the mountain, and there is the hermit on the top of the mountain. And the, and the spiritual seeker says, please tell me, what is the meaning of life? And there are always different answers. But basically, if you waste this life on creature, creature comforts, then it doesn't have much meaning. If you make sure that you're going to use it uh, to, uh, so that in the future, at the very least, you'll be in a comfortable rebirth that you can use to better yourself and to help other beings. That means like in a human body, or if you can use it to even reach liberation or Buddhahood in this lifetime, then you've made your life meaningful because you've done something with it. There's no inherent meaning or not. It's just the benefit that you make of the situation you're in. And we all have this power. So we have to recognize it. If we don't recognize it, you don't want to think about what's going to happen next. The math is not looking good, as I said this morning. The chances of getting human life the next time around are very slim if you leave it up to chance. For every single human being on this planet, and that's human beings, not those who have a precious human, um, human life. For every single human, there are like probably four or five billion animals, billion animals for every one human. This is including insects. I'm not counting um, uh, single cellular animals right now. Um, if we count singular cell cellular animals, it's an even worse situation, far worse situation. So, and most of the animals on this planet have very short lifetimes, like you have termites or ants, shrimps or anchovies. They live how long? A couple months at most, maybe a few weeks. So like there are, and there are billions upon billions of these animals, trillions or quadrillions. I think of termites, they're like quintillions, like 250 quintillion termites. And so they're constantly being reborn. So like there are tons of termite birds waiting for you. How many human births? Like how many termite generations are there in a single human, human lifetime? There's so many. So at any given moment, when you have died and you have the karma to be reborn on this earth, and you're looking for your next rebirth, there are billions upon billions of uh, potential humans, uh, excuse me, potential animal parents for every single human parent, right? Just astronomical uh, difference between the two. And that's only doing the math for this planet. If there are other planets where there are no human beings, Forget about it. If you include the, the hungry ghosts and, and hells, it's even worse. Uh, so if we want to make sure that we're going to be human next, we have to actively do something to make that happen. So we have to make good use of this life that we have now. Now, usually, traditionally, when you talk about a precious human life, we talk about it as the eight leisures and ten resources, and you can read about that. There are other instructions on that. But there's another way to think about it. There is a text by the eighth Karmapa, Mikya Dorje, on mind training. It's kind of similar to the seven points of mind training that we often study, but it's different. It's, um, it's a very interesting text. And in it, uh, there is the um, contemplation of the precious human birth. He actually has, I think, is it eight? Eight. So, and there's several, there, he has several contemplations of the precious human birth. It's either eight or 10. I don't remember which right now. And in one of those, he says that when we talk about the precious human birth, when we say the leisures and resources, the leisures, instead of meaning not being born as a hell or a hungry ghost or animal or all that, a leisure means longing for virtue, wanting to do virtuous things. And the resources means actually doing them. So the really, that means, if you think about it in that way, what makes your human body, your human birth precious, is when you want to do something virtuous, and then you actually do it. Then you can say you have a precious human body. Otherwise, this human body is just you know, not worth much. Merely being born human and having the opportunity to contact the Dharma is not enough. You have to actually want to practice the Dharma and then engage in Dharma practice. That's what makes our lives precious. Otherwise, it's no different than being reborn as like a turtle. 
our body is otherwise no different than a steak. It's just a piece of red meat, right? There's nothing precious about red meat. That's all this is. A little bit of skin on top, white skin for me. There's nothing else there. It's not precious unless you use it well. Around New Year's time, the Karmapa said something I thought was really beautiful. He said, imagine that a thousand lifetimes from now in the future, you're looking back at all your lifetimes. This human lifetime that lasts a hundred years max, well, 110, I don't know if, you know, it's hard to use those last year as well. When you look at it, even 120, even if you live to 150, it's just going to be a blip. You'll hardly notice it unless you do something, um, unless you do something with it. It's like with the story of the Buddha. In the past, he was a poor Brahmin farmer, and he offered the previous Buddha, a previous Buddha also named Shakyamuni, a bowl of porridge, and he made the aspiration to be just like him. So he was like us. He was exactly the same as us. He roused bodhicitta. That was when he first roused bodhicitta. So if you look at it on a cosmic scale, that lifetime as a farmer probably wasn't much longer than 50 or 60 years, right? Incredibly short, but he did something really meaningful. So it was more than just a blip and we can do the same. It's uh, in this very lifetime. So these meditations on the precious human body and on death and impermanence are very important, very helpful for us. So I think sometimes what happens is we don't feel like we're getting anywhere in our Dharma practice. You've been meditating, it kind of helps. You know, you start meditating, and when you start meditating, it's like, wow, look at this, it's great. And then you kind of hit a plateau. Yeah, you do it, it's okay, but I'm not really feeling like I'm getting anywhere. It's helping, but it's kind of stagnant. So if that is the case for you, the best thing you can do is meditate on these four thoughts that turn the mind to really meditate on them, to really take the time to go through them. Not just to do the cursory sort of, yeah, that makes sense. If that's all you're saying, you haven't got it. You've got to keep going. Uh, you have to really meditate them until it really gets deep inside. They're easy to understand intellectually and that fools us. So we think we can go right on and do something more advanced. But the point isn't that we need to understand them intellectually. The point is to feel them deep inside ourselves. Otherwise, um, it's what benefit is it? It often says that we should meditate upon impermanence until it pierces our heart. So and you need to meditate on the precious human body until you feel deep in your bones how incredibly lucky we are. And until you'd be horrified at the thought that you might let it go to, go to waste. That is kind of the point that we need to get to. Even then, you still have to keep doing it. So if you do, if you do meditate on them to that point, you'll see the results. You, again, you take it step by step. You don't expect to get to that point immediately. It takes a long time. Not everyone gets there, but any little bit that you do is going to be beneficial. So that's a bit of a digression. Uh, whenever I teach the Dharma, I always end up speaking about the four thoughts that turn the mind. I think it's basically all I really ever teach, um, no matter what the topic is. But um, anyways, they come up over and over again in the works of all the great masters. I mean, it's Shantideva all throughout this book, The Way of the Bodhisattva. The four thoughts that turn the mind come up over and over again. If you look at the, the writings of Mikya Dorje, filled with talk about impermanence. Milarepa, so many talk, so much, so many songs about impermanence. Gampopa, Dusim Kempa, the great Kadampa masters, they're all speaking about the four thoughts that turn the mind. It's not a sexy Dharma topic like Mahamudra or Dzogchen, but it's really helpful. So it's probably time for us to get back to Shanti Deva. Hello, I've gone. Oh dear. <laughs> I've ranted for a long time today already. I'm glad you were all still staying with me. So now that's the, we've gone through the laziness of clinging to bad actions. And so now we've come to the uh, second uh, type of laziness. Excuse me, we've been through the laziness of sloth. And so we've come to the second type of laziness, the laziness of clinging to bad actions. Um, so, um, what this means, 
as I said this morning, is clinging to acts that we do for pleasure, that are kind of useful, but they're going to prevent you from practicing dharma or create obstacles in your dharma practice. They're generally neutral actions um, that we're talking about. Of course, it does include obviously negative act and actions, but we de- specifically mean our neutral activities that you do just to pass the time and enjoy yourself. So Netflix, enjoying leisurely meals and long conversations, or games and sports and the arts. So when you're spending time doing them, you are not doing your dharma practice. Uh, so they're pleasurable for the time being, but they won't be worth anything in the future. And even worse, they will provoke your attachments and other afflictions. And so therefore leading to more suffering in the future. As Shanti Deva says in the next stanza, let me get there. Forsaking the sublime joy of Dharma, the cause in, of infinite delight. Why do you relish such distractions in games that will cause suffering? So what we need to do is we need to bring ourselves and others happiness and we need to eliminate suffering. So we need to be spending our time doing and being diligent about the things that will actually bring happiness, which means Dharma practice, listening, contemplating and meditating. If we're doing that, that's harmonious with the Dharma. It promotes our Dharma practice and it will bring good results. But if we do not, then at best we're distracted. And there's a great danger. Once you get distracted, there's the danger that we're going to act on our own attachments and aversions, anger, pride, envy, or the other afflictions. So in other words, in our daily life, we need to act with mindfulness, awareness, and carefulness. And we have to do our best to uh, maintain a pure motivation of bodhicitta. And so if our actions distract us from that, they're not helping us, no matter how pleasant they may seem at the moment. So you have to look honestly at yourself because attachments are tricky. They're fooling us into thinking we're practicing the Dharma when actually we're just indulging in what we enjoy or the afflictions. So you have to be honest with yourself. Another aspect is that they often bring suffering. These, they seem pleasure, but they actually, pleasurable, but they actually bring suffering. Uh, for example, what do people do for pleasure? You go to party, you go to the bar. What do you do if you go to the bar? You drink alcohol, then you get drunk and you engage in sexual misconduct. You've gone to a bar and it's in the COVID ap- epidemic and so you end up with a uh, COVID, right? Or um, so, and even if nothing bad seems to happen, so many of our problems come up because of the stupid things we do about relationships and alcohol and so forth. So it just leads to um, suffering in the, in the future. So, um, when Rinpoche taught about this last year in, on, uh, uh, in Varanasi, he spoke about how clinging to bad actions, uh, even the neutral pastimes bring suffering in the short term and in the long term. And when we understand that, we will think that we have to do something that brings a good result soon, which it means listening, contemplating, and meditating on the Dharma. So that is the discussion of the uh, how to eliminate the laziness of clinging to bad actions. So there's only one uh, stanza for that particular um, uh, for that particular um, type of laziness. So we've gone through the first two types. We've got three types, right? Sloth, clinging to bad actions, and now we've come to the third: self disparagement. Okay, so how do you deal with self disparagement? Excuse me for a moment. So self-disparagement basically means you're thinking that you can't do it. I can't become a Buddha. I couldn't do everything you have to become to to achieve Buddhahood. So it's lacking self-confidence. So you might think, I can't achieve Buddhahood any more than I could run as fast as like Usain Bolt, you know, the Jamaican sprinter. I can't run as fast as him. Actually, when I was first thinking about this, I was thinking about Carl Lewis, but that probably dates me. Uh, Usain Bolt is more recent, I think. You might think, I just can't run 100 meters in less than 10 seconds. I can't train as hard as he does. Similarly, I can't reach Buddhahood, and I don't want to go through all the pain and trouble to get there. But there's a big difference between reaching Buddhahood and athletics. When you're doing athletics, 
your body is physically limited. There are only certain things you can do with your, with your bodies, and some people's bodies have more limits than others. But when you're achieving Buddhahood, it's with your mind, and there are no limits to your mind. There's nothing, no limit to what you can do with your mind. You just have to decide. You have to the comp if you have the confidence, you can do it. So that is what Shanti Deva describes in the next passage. So there are two kind of two parts to this passage: a discussion of the methods of overcoming self-disparagement about the result. That means disparaging yourself and saying that you couldn't become a Buddha. And there's also a discussion of the methods for overcoming self-disparagement about the cause, the six transcendences. And that means the self-discouragement of thinking, I could never endure the hardships of the path of the six transcendences. But this passage in general begins a brief overview of the meditations that we have to practice, kind of as, a, um, as a, an overview of this chapter and the next. And it reads, don't be discouraged. Practice with the force's purpose and self-control, the equality of self and others, and exchanging yourself for others. So this is actually a really interesting stanza. It's like a summary of the rest of this chapter and of the eighth chapter. So it begins by saying, don't be discouraged. In other words, don't disparage yourself. And then it tells you what you need to over do to overcome discouragement and how you can meditate on bodhicitta. So the second line talks about three tools for practice or three ways you can practice the four forces, purpose, and per purpose, which is also called perseverance and self-control. So they're described later on in the chapter. We will talk about them tomorrow. And then you use these forces, purpose, and self-control to meditate on two things. These are the equality of self and others and exchanging yourself and others. So these are the two primary meditations taught in the eighth chapter the meditations on relative uh, bodhicitta. Uh, that's going to be a different teaching. We're not going to get to them this weekend. We'll see about scheduling a next teaching. Mm, too early to think about that. I've got to get through this one first. We all have to get through this one first. So basically what this is saying, you don't need to be discouraged because they're meditations that you can do and anyone can do them. And if you do these meditations, you will find that you are able, so you can have confidence in yourself. There's no reason you can't be confident in yourself. So the next three stanzas, I mean, there's a little bit of, with this stanza, there is some discussion about whether Shantideva actually wrote it or not. But we're just going to take it as a given that Shantideva wrote it. I won't go into it right now. I'm kind of already blabbing too much. So the, the next three stanzas teach us about um, what, uh, what to, how you do not need to discourage yourself and think that you can't achieve Buddhahood. Actually, any sentient being can achieve Buddhahood, and we as humans especially uh, have even more capacity than most animals or most other beings. As it says in verse 17, don't get demoralized and think, how is it I could be awakened? For the Tathagata who speaks the truth has truly spoken thus. So here, Shantideva is saying, there's no reason for you to be discouraged. There's no reason for you to disparage yourself. You do not need to doubt that you can achieve enlightenment. The Buddha taught that all sentient beings are the same in being able to achieve enlightenment. Through the power of his meditation, the Buddha has seen the nature of things and has seen that all sentient beings have the same nature. And they're all able to achieve Buddhahood. All of us are able to achieve Buddhahood. So Shantideva continues. Whoops. Somehow it went uh, one page too far. Okay. If they should rouse the strength of effort, even gnats, mosquitoes, bees, and worms will gain what is so hard to, so hard to achieve, unexcelled enlightenment. So here Shantideva is saying, Quoting, um, saying what is taught in the sutra, the sutra requested by Subahu, that even any sentient being, even an at gnat or mosquito, if they do the meditation, practice the path, can achieve unexcelled enlightenment or Buddhahood. And so this is the quote from the sutra. And so here, it's the sutra requested by Subahu. And here the Buddha said, um, Subhuti, furthermore, a bodhisattva should train thus. 
If even those who are lions, tigers, dogs, jackals, ants, or mosquitoes will awaken to completely perfect enlightenment, why should I, while I am human, uh, ever let, even at the cost of my own life, uh, my diligence that will bring uh, uh, the achievement of perfect, uh, of completely perfect way of, an, ah, I'm having trouble reading today. Why should I, why, uh, while I'm human, ever let, even at the cost of my life, my diligence that will bring the achievement of completely perfect enlightenment wane? So there are stories in the, in the sutras in the, of, of animals doing virtuous acts that later cause them to achieve enlightenment. There's the famous story about um, a dog chasing a pig around a stupa. You've probably heard several different verses this several times. Later, both the dog and the pig achieved enlightenment. There's another story in the Vinaya. The Buddha was crossing a river and there were 400 frogs who saw him and felt faith, frogs. They were immediately died, reborn as humans, and they all, in their next lifetime, all practiced the Dharma and became arhats. So this is actually, you know, these are stories that the Buddha taught. Uh, so, uh, so in the Mahayana, it's taught that all sentient beings can achieve Buddhahood, no matter how lowly or heinous they may be. So that's why we have bodhicitta. If um, there would be no point in having bodhicitta if there is nothing we could do for a sentient being, right? If you want to help another sentient being become Buddha and there's no way for them to become a Buddha, what point? It's like wishing that a rock becomes a Buddha. Why bother wishing at a rock? So if gnats and mosquitoes can reach enlightenment, so can we, especially since we are human, as Shantideva says in the next uh, stanza. If I, born in the human race, can recognize what helps and harms and don't give up enlightened conduct, why wouldn't I reach enlightenment? So as human beings, we have the opportunity, uh, to, or we have the intelligence that we can use to discern what's going on, what is going to be helpful and what is not. We can, uh, and so that we can understand what we need to do. Sometimes we ne neglect to use this intelligence, but that doesn't mean that we lack it. Animals don't have such capacity as we do. Uh, and so we and other uh, beings in other realms do not have this capacity. So if, the, if we have, if um, there's no reason why we cannot achieve enlightenment, if we, um, if we just put the effort into it. I remember actually uh, a teaching that I um, received from Sita Rinpoche once where he said that um, now that we are human, we are halfway there. We're halfway to Bu enlightenment Buddhahood. It might seem like it's a long way off, but we've already come a very long way. So it just depends on kind of how you're looking at it. It's like you're going on a long road trip. It's like a thousand miles and they're miles, not kilometers. So for all of you in Canada, it's even further than you think. It's gonna take a long time to get there. So when you're going down the road, tri driving down the highway and you see that sign that says Nirvana, 500 miles, you can look at it two ways. You can say, 500 miles, that's so long away. And Biden's passed the infrastructure plan. So all the roads are torn up from construction. It's gonna take forever to get there, right? There are gonna be all these bumpy detours. It's gonna be like driving in India. Or you can say, look at it, we're halfway there. Look how far we've made it. We're gonna get there soon. So it all depends on how you look at it. So that's the uh, general ta talk about this uh, self-disparagement about achieving the result Buddhahood. We're all able to do it. Now, when we talk about achieving Buddhahood though, we have to practice the six transcendences and we might find that, that think that this is a really uh, difficult thing to do. We can't do the practices. You read the stories of the Jataka tales and say, I can't do it. You read about the Buddha sacrificing his body to feed a tigress or his cups, or about the story about the Buddha cutting a big hunk of flesh out of his thigh to give to someone who needed it to make medicine. You say, not for me, too scary. So when we talk about generosity, there are different types. With material generosity in particular, there's giving, great giving and difficult giving. And when you're giving your body or parts of your body to benefit other sentient beings, that is difficult generosity. But you don't do that as a beginning. Eventually as a bodhisattva, you should be willing, but not right away. You have to start. 
Uh, so, but you might have that fear. And so that's what Shantideva describes in the next stanza where he says, but I'm afraid of sacrificing my limbs and such, I say, not thinking what is severe and what is light. Delusion has left me in fear. So, uh, so this is our fear. We're afraid that we're going to have to sacrifice parts of our body or even our lives. But that actually comes from not thinking through things through clearly. We're not recognizing what is severe. That is, what is really painful? What is really difficult to bear? Or what is light? That is, what is easy to bear? We're deluded because we're not thinking about the long scale of time. And that, so we're thinking about only right now, and that makes us afraid. So the reason is what Shanti Deva describes in the next uh, stanza. For countless millions of eons, I will be hacked and stabbed and burnt and rent asunder many times, but not achieve enlightenment. So if we don't achieve enlightenment, we'll be, de- we'll be reborn in the lower realms or we'll be hunted, chased, killed, devoured, hacked apart, slaughtered, and all of that. Not just once, but over and over again for many, many lifetimes over countless eons. We don't have a choice to avoid that except by practicing the Dharma. So even worse, when we experience those, all those agonies in future Dharma lifetimes, they're not going to do any good. They won't bring us closer to enlightenment. And even, uh, even more than that, as ordinary beings, we'll react with anger and then do more misdeeds ourselves, meaning that we're going to take even more dreadful rebirths in lower realms where we'll experience more sufferings and it'll all be pointless. So the practice of, if you're going to do difficult giving, though, if you as a bodhisattva are you going to um, practice difficult giving, it's different. It's limited, as Shanti Deva says. The suffering for me to achieve enlightenment, though, has a limit like pain from an incision made to excise a painful foreign object. So the example Shantideva gives is of surgery. So now, surgery in Shantideva's time was different than now. They did not have anesthetics. But even with modern surgery, it can be painful. But we're willing to do it because we know that the pain is limited and small in comparison to the pain of not being cured. For example, a lot of people get knee replacements. Does a knee replacement hurt? but yes, but less than wobbling around on a bad knee. So you're willing to put up with it. It's the same with the pain that comes from the difficult giving on the path of of the bodhisattva. It's limited in scope. You're going to die. It only takes a few minutes to die, but it has a great result. Uh, So when the Buddha in the previous lifetime sacrificed his body to feed a tigress, it must have been painful for the period while he was being eaten, but that couldn't have been too long once the tigress actually started eating him. And then it had great results. In the short term, he was reborn as a god. And in the long term, he perfected transcendent generosity and achieved Buddhahood. So there's no need to fear the pain and discomfort of the path. Uh, as Shantideva says in the next stanza, all physicians cure disease with the discomfort of a treatment. Therefore, put up with small distress to overcome myriad sufferings. So you need to be able to put up with suffering. Uh, and uh, so this is similar to the very first line of the chapter, uh, which reads, thus with pra- patience, be diligent. So no pain, no gain. Um, but the supreme physician does not use, excuse me, the supreme physician does not use commonly, commonplace treatments such as those. He cures unfathomably great dis- diseases with the most gentle of remedies. So the supreme physician means the Buddha. He's often compared to a doctor. And he's very, very skilled. And at the beginning, in particular, the Buddha prescribes gentle treatments. It's not like you show up at the new Dharma center and they immediately call the live organ tra- trans- excuse me, they, they immediately call the live organ transplant team from Monty Python. It's not like say, here, we've got a live one that's come and get a liver. That's not what they're doing. Instead, what do you do? You sit down on a cushion. You study, you listen to a Dharma talk, you do some meditation, you do a puja, you feel faith. You do a bread of generosity and gradually uh, develop yourself. You take things a step at a time. Initially, the sage prescribes giving away vegetables and the like. Eventually, when used to that, you will be able to give of your flesh. So when the Buddha taught about generosity, he did not teach difficult giving first. Instead, he encouraged people to give, um, to give vegetables to the Sangha. And then as you got used to giving vegetables, then you can start feeling comfortable in more being more generous and giving larger gifts. 
then when you've truly trained yourself in generosity, uh, you'll be able to even give parts of your body away or sacrifice your life. So it's kind of like the story of the miser whom the Buddha taught generosity by first having him practice giving something from his right hand to the left. The miser is sitting there, I have to give this from my right hand to my left. So difficult, I can't do it. And he managed to do it and it worked. And then he did it again. And then eventually he was able to easily give things from his right hand to his left. Then he could give things from his left hand to the right. Then he could give small things to other people and eventually he became very generous. So it's like you take it in steps. For once you understand your body <clears throat> to be like vegetables and such, what difficulty would there be in relinquishing your flesh and such? So as you train on the Bodhisattva path, you gain greater understanding of the nature of things. <clears throat> you see that your body is just a material object. It's no different from vegetables in essence. It's all just matter. Water, no different. The only difference is that we cling to this body as being me or mine, but on the physical level, it's all just matter. <clears throat> it's no different than the steak at the meat counter in the supermarket. No different. When you realize that, then the body is neither you, nor is it yours, then it's not difficult to give it away. But you shouldn't try this before you're ready. Instead, you train yourself <clears throat> um, like, like we talk. Excuse me. <coughs> yes. Instead, it's a gradual process of training yourself. You start with what you're able, and then you push yourself a little bit, and then you push yourself a little bit more. You don't push yourself too much that you can't do it completely, but maybe a bit more than you can, than you really feel comfortable. I actually don't think it's so unusual to think about sacrificing your body or sacrificing your life. There are people who do that for their jobs. Think of fire people, firefighters, fighting the wildfires in, that we're having all over in Canada and in uh, the U.S. in the West and Australia. People are risking their lives to fight them. And I think that there's anyone, I mean, almost everyone <coughs> has had an experience where you've done something that you were afraid of you thought was going to be difficult, you found that you were able to do it and it brought great rewards. So here, the reward of practicing generosity is being able to benefit yourself and to truly gain the ability to help others become free of suffering. And when you think about that, how amazing would that be? If you actually were able to bring sentient beings to Buddhahood and even protect just a few people, just amazing. Uh, and if you think about that, uh, enough, I think you'd easily see it be possible to willingly undergo a bit of suffering yourself in order to bring that about. Now, another fear that um, people have about practicing the transcendence is in the path of the Bodhisattva is that you are um, going to be in samsara for a long time, especially if you read the sutras and says the Buddha is going to be, excuse me, it takes three uncountable eons to achieve um, uh, to achieve Buddhahood. And an uncountable eon is, it's an actual number, it's 10 to the 59th Buddhas. So three times 10 to the 59th eons. And each eon is millions of years long. Oh, I can't do that, you think. Samsara the whole time. You think that while you're on the path, you're going to still experience all the sufferings of samsara. You're still going to be born and experience birth, aging, sickness, and death. So you might get discouraged. But for a bodhisattva, it's different, and there's no need to fear remaining in samsara. As Shantideva says in the next stanza, there is no pain from giving up wrong, no melancholy from being wise, for harm to the body is from misdeeds and harm to the mind from misconceptions. So for the bodhisattva, there's no difficulty to remain in samsara. The reason is that bodhisattvas are different than ordinary individuals. Ordinary individuals have all the afflictions, greed, hatred, desire, and all that. And as a result, they experience many different sufferings. But the bodhisattvas are meditating on the path, and they're taming their beings, so they no longer commit any misdeeds. And if you don't commit misdeeds, then you won't experience suffering, because the cause of suffering is misdeeds. In addition, bodhisattvas know the Dharma well, and that protects them from mental suffering. So mental suffering comes from misunderstandings or misconceptions. But the bodhis, bodhisattvas have rooted these out through their meditation. So they understand the nature of things. You listen, you contemplate, you meditate, and the deeper you understand the nature of things, the less hard things are to bear. 
Shantideva continues, if physical pleasure is from merit <clears throat> and mental pleasure from being wise, would the compassionate despair to stay in samsara for others' sake? So not only do uh, uh, sentient beings experience no, excuse me, not only do bodhisattvas experience no physical or mental suffering, they also have great physical and mental pleasure. Their understanding of the nature of things is so good that they couldn't possibly feel discouraged or depressed or afraid of being in samsara. They understand what the suffering is coming from and they are avoid its causes. And it must be just, I just I, it must be so exciting when you see that you're actually benefiting someone you're doing something that helps them. Even when you do something that helps someone a little bit, it's like enjoyable. And if you are able to be a bodhisattva and do things that help people so much, it just must be delightful. So what, it would just be joy to stay. Why would anyone despair? So fear and discouragement come because you're concerned about yourself. It's a selfish thought. What's gonna to happen to me? But bodhisattvas no longer have selfish thoughts. So ordinary individuals act upon what they consider in their own uh, self-interest in this lifetime. But the, and the, the, and the Shravaka or listener disciples of the Buddha act upon their own self-interest self for achieving liberation. But bodhisattvas train instead in the motivation of cherishing others more than one yourself, more than you cherish yourself. And that motivation is primarily altruistic. So you're not interested. You don't care what's going to happen. To, you're not interested in yourself. So you no longer care what's going to happen in this lifetime. And when you don't care about what happens in this lifetime, it doesn't matter. So it's all a delight. <clears throat> so you're never going to lose heart. Um, so, uh, and so for that reason, the bodhisattvas are really superior to the other, um, uh, to the other practitioners. So when you uh, so because of the power of bodhicitta exhausts one merit from the past and gathers oceans of merit, it's taught that they suppress sur, surpass the shravakas. So the bodhicitta exhausts the purifies the misdeeds and it gathers a large amount of merit as we described this morning, and it's far more than would be possible than if you were acting out of self interest. So there's a story about this in the Gandavyuha Sutra. It tells of three boys. One of them would later become the Buddha, and two of them would become his uh, two great disciples, Shariputra and Maudgalayana. So they were talking one day about what they wanted to become. And one of them said, wouldn't it be wonderful to become a Buddha? And the other said, oh yeah, that'd be nice, but it's too hard, takes too long. <clears throat> Becoming an Arhat's easier. I just want to be an Arhat, free myself from suffering. That's enough. So the one of them had the bodhicitta to become a Buddha, the other two did not. So the one who roused uh, the bodhicitta and became the Buddha Shakyamuni, he gained enlightenment first. The other two could not achieve enlightenment until the Buddha Shakyamuni had already achieved Buddhahood. So it took them longer. So it's actually faster to achieve enlightenment if you have bodhicitta. <laughs> so to sum up these um, methods for giving up um, <clears throat> bodhicitta, or for giving up laziness. Now there is, it says in verse thir uh, 30, so ride the horse of bodhicitta that banishes all weariness. Who in their senses would be lazy to go from one joy to the next? So the path to Buddhahood, when you read it, sounds like it's really difficult. You might think that you can't get there. But if you have the motivation of bodhicitta, if you really think about bodhicitta, if you really take it to heart, take the time to think about it, and it takes time to understand it, but you've got to put the time in, then there's not much hardship. Instead, it's a great joy. It's like you have a really good horse or like you have an airplane, a private jet. You can just sit back and relax. You don't have, you know, you don't have to worry about anyone else. You've got plenty of room. You're in a private jet and you can go around the world as quickly with very little effort. So it's similar with the, uh, with the bodhicitta. So these instructions that we have been uh, talking about this afternoon, they're very important. These are really critical teachings. They may sound really simple, but they're extremely beneficial. Often when we hear about Dharma teachings, we immediately get excited about Mahamudra, Dzogchen, 
Kala Chakra, Middle Way, these high teachings, so exciting, so profound, but you will not get very far with any of them if you are not diligent. You will not get far with any of them if you don't have the right attitude. And you won't have the right attitude unless you do contemplations such as these. So it's really important to do these contemplations. You need to take the time to meditate on your precious human body. You need to take the time and meditate on death and impermanence and on the reasons why there is no need to be discouraged. And so for many of us, these simple practices are actually the most profound practices that we can do even if it doesn't sound like a uh, one of those big, you know, what I sometimes kind of jokingly call the sexy Dharma practices. These are not sexy Dharma practices. These are the everyday ones, but they are the ones that are going to benefit you the most. So um, that is enough for this afternoon. And so I see we've got about 50 people, give or take, listening to these teachings this morning and um, this afternoon. So um, I think tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon, depending on which, depending on how long I rant and rave, uh, we should have some time for, uh, uh, for some questions. So um, if you uh, can think about your questions then uh, and let us know tomorrow morning, uh, I think because we have about 50 people, we can probably do it on the uh, sort of raise your hand or whatever sort of way of doing the questions. So we'll think about how, how to work that out, and I'll let you know about that tomorrow. But do think about if you have any questions. So that is um, enough for this afternoon. And that means that we need to recite the closing prayers. So for the closing prayers, we will recite the long life prayers for the Gyalon Karmapa and for Tranga Rinpoche and then the dedication of merit and the aspiration to achieve um, <clears throat> the, the aspiration for bodhicitta that we spoke about this morning. And the reason why we are reciting the long life prayers for the Karmapa and Tranga Rinpoche, I mean, these two are in particular because of our connection in Tranga Monastery. Um, um, uh, but uh, in particular because of our connection, but also when we're praying that the gurus remain long, we're pray praying that they stay here to teach the Dharma, uh, that they give us the teaching. So that's why, because if the gurus pass away at young ages, they can't teach as much. Uh, so we're asking that, the, uh, that they stay for a long time and continue to teach the Dharma. So thinking in this way, now let's please recite these uh, aspiration, these long life prayers and dedication prayers. Lion <laughs> Ten be pa jur kar ma lo drusha Chupa saan bo yun den ka jam tu Pe shin sha pe ta den shi drup ki Chen 
ke gana che ba long tro ba se pe so le dro ku nyo dro sho chan tro sem tro rim po che ma ke pa nam ke jur chi ke pa nyam pa me pa riang kon ne gong du pel wa sho So um, if you don't, we'll see how the questions go tomorrow. And you can also email the questions um, if you like this afternoon or this mo tomorrow morning. So thank you. And we will see you tomorrow morning or even afternoon for some of you. We will see you tomorrow, <laughs> whatever time zone you're in. Thank you, Kempo. Thank you. Thank you.